Hi everyone, I am Purnima and I'm here to take you through exploring new social frontiers with kids. And I know the title sounds very big and large, but it's a very simple journey of how I came into gaming and what we continue to do here. So let's get started. So this started back in 2000 and this was when I got introduced to games. Uh, I did dabble with a bit of Mario, Duck Hunt, Tetris and those small devices we used to get at home. But it wasn't until my 12th standard where my parents decided to invest in a computer system. And with Academia, games came into be. My friend introduced me to games like Age of Empires 2 and Warcraft 3. And with that, I started foraying into games a lot more. What I loved about it as in games like Zoo is I learned about Greek mythology. And that intrigued me to find these comparisons between Hindu mythology and what we do in Greek mythology, dig deeper. With Age of Empires, I learned about civilizations, about different technology, different ages, strategies. And with Warcraft 3, it was about this fantasy world, beautiful narrative, storytelling, immersive cinematics. And I just felt lost and loving in that world. And around this time is when I started to do some campaigns in Age of Empires. And well into engineering, I used to make these campaigns and share it with people and they used to give me feedback. I didn't quite know that I was doing some part of game design back then, but this kind of will go on to help me shape up my career. I would like to recite one incident. Uh, this is again back in 2001. Now this, this is times when there are no internet, or if you do have internet, it's very slow. It's more of a privilege to have any of this. So if you had to game, or if you had to browse the internet, you go to cyber cafes or LAN cafes. And in one such gaming cyber cafe moment, me and two other guy friends of mine, uh, we were thinking of playing this game called Quake 3 Arena. And while we were discussing this, there were three other guys who were constantly mocking us because I am a female. And given that, I can't game. Interestingly enough, I decided to challenge them for a match, us three versus them three. When I did that, the intention was not about winning or losing because I had no data. I didn't know how good they were, how they didn't know how good I was. But the opportunity to show them that I can play. And that was the only motive. It so happened that we did win the match. What I love to think about that day is they apologized right after. And it also made me realize something because my friends always treated me as an equal. They taught me how to game. I got better than them. They used to challenge me constantly. I never felt like an outsider because of my gender. And yet this incident made me realize that's not the truth. I just got lucky. And with the rise of online games, when I thought things would get better, it didn't. To the extent that, you know, you reveal your gender. If I say I am a female gamer, one of two things happens. Either they will help you through the thing because you are the damsel in distress, or it will continue to be bullying and trolling and sexual remarks being passed. And I still face that problem. I try to not reveal my gender when I'm going online to play games. And I'm sure a lot of women face this as well. And to the extent that they may even quit play altogether. We already have societal hurdles that women face especially coming into a niche field, which is considered a boy zone like gaming, and then we don't make it any easier for them. Now, having said that, there is a beauty of community that takes from virtual to real connections. What happens in this is I have friends who I met online through games, and now they are very close friends of mine in real life. And there are so many instances like that. And from there, we have also moved on to people starting their life together. They're married, they've had kids, and they have, you know, they're getting their kids also into gaming. It's, it's a beautiful world. There has been guilds and communities that constantly help mental issues as well. They've helped their friends. It's a beautiful connection that we all form. And I know it's not the popular opinion because when we say people play games, we often think it's a waste of time. It's the lack of awareness. You know, if you look a few years back, this is the same for sports. If you're playing badminton, if you're playing cricket, if you're playing football, it was considered you're wasting your time and not studying. But today there are proper careers that can be made out of it. 
and people are sending their kids to camps. Gaming camps are coming up for professional gamers. We already are seeing an inflow of gaming courses that are coming up in colleges. It's a legit career for all of us to pursue. But like game design and life, balance is key. Everything needs to be consumed at the right amount. Now, coming back to what I said about my career, and in 2006, I got this opportunity to work as a game programmer, purely by chance. I was looking for a job. My college mate said there is an opportunity. I joined them. One month into it, they were looking for game designers, and no one really knew what is game design. Uh, this is when Google was new, so you don't even have too many options out there. So at that point, the campaigns that I made during my engineering days helped me. My friend recommended, hey, from your requirements, this is like something Purnima can do. Can we give her a shot? And they did. They gave me this Dungeons & Dragons manual, which is basically the Bible of a genre of games called role-playing game. It's an entire world written to detail. Complete simulation, equations, world building, creatures, characters, races, proficients, everything included. And I just remember opening that and falling in love. And I think that's when I realized, you know, all these worlds and games that I used to play and enjoy and be immersed. And today, I can be the one who creates it. I can play God. I can make a beautiful story in my own passion come through and then have that validation coming from the people who will consume it. And that made me write something called the game design document. I, my first game design document was a hundred pager. I just went all in. And it's still one of my favorites. Having said that, since when I started my career, this is 2006 to now, I've seen the female populace doing this. Those who started with me are not here. We need to make the industry a lot more inclusive and we are constantly fighting for that. But all hope is not lost. I am still here. I'm still standing. 18 years and still going strong. Now let me give you a sneak peek into something behind the scenes of how a game designer would think. Uh, that's an entire topic by itself, but I'll try to minimize it in a small portion for you. Games often mimic life. And by that, what we mean is it's a reflection of who we are. A lot of our psychological inputs are also taken as game design needs. On the other hand, we have the economy. And what does that mean? You know, you get coins, gems, uh, coins in game. These are nothing but economy. And they are a sample-sized representation of how the larger economy works. Now, what I'm showing you here is what we call feedback loops. And in games, and if you, if you will actually always try to relate it with anything in real life, you will be able to make that comparison. So how is the easy way to explain is this. You're doing a particular action, and that action is going to give you some sort of a reward. And from that reward, you're able to gain a power that now helps your next action make it easier. This is the positive feedback loop. So basically, we plant this. In some way, you need to have your adrenaline pumping to have the dopamine release. And only if the dopamine release comes in, you're going to get pumped to do the activity all over again. So this is what we do in game design. We mimic this. And with that, we also have to talk about some few other things. Some of my favorites. You know, you talk about probability. In games, if we say one in 10 chances, you will get this item. Mathematical probability works very differently. What happens is your flawed psyche is going to think, if I don't get it nine times, the tenth time, I'm definitely getting it. That's not how mathematical probability works. However, as humans, our psyche will never tell us that. So as game designers, we plant it. We check for these triggers if someone has received the item or not, and we add those extra layers of rules into the game. We also have something called coyote type. Uh, this is actually coming from Looney Tunes, Wiley Coyote. And if you see any of the old cartoons, you will see this very interesting phenomena. You are in a ledge or a cliff, and this character will be running, and only when the character looks down, will it fall. There is a hang type you will see in these old cartoons. You know what? We replicate that in games. 
when you play platformer games, which is basically you're jumping from ledge to ledge, sometimes you will face that you are almost out of the ledge, but you still were able to make the jump. It gives you that endowment that I tricked the system. But you didn't. The game designers have planted that hang tag. But we want you to feel that. And that's exactly why it is there. It is not to show you are better than me or I'm better than you. It is to give you that pleasure of that moment that you made it happen. And that's how we invoke emotions through these mechanics as well. And to quickly take you through economy, a very, very simple scenario of it. In the same thing, when you're doing an action and you get a particular reward, you're basically earning something. So if you think of coins, you're earning some coins. Now from there, you're going to spend these coins to attain some sort of a power or a skill that is now going to make you so much better and you know easier to level up in the less next set of actions. So this is where your motivation comes in. So this is how we sort of play with mechanics, psychology, economy, and all try to come together to give you the experience of what game. And for that, I have some games for you to look at, not too many, but they have implemented some of this so brilliantly and they're some of my favorites. So let's start with that dragon cancer. It is a shadowing tale of parents who lost their child to terminal cancer. Who would have thought that we could make games out of this? It is such an emotional game. I remember playing through it. You know what's the ending. It's something that's given to you. And at the same time, when you are playing through this, you are sad, you're crying, but at the same time, they have immortalized their child and, and given support to parents who go through such similar experience. The next game is Gris. Gris talks about five stages of grief as one of my absolute favorite games. When it takes you through these five stages of grief, it is not a single text in the game. The entire narrative is conveyed through visuals audio and game mechanics. To give you a small example of it, when you start the game, if grief, you have lost someone, you are in pain, you can't think. So how do we communicate that to the player without really telling them that? So the best way they did was through controls. So when you start, the character is just down. It is unable to get up. So you have to constantly press the button to make the character get up. And then you constantly press the forward button to make the character move. And the movement is so slow for a while until it picks up. It is giving you the essence of the pain through just the way that your input is not exactly reacting in a normal scenario. So by controlling that, we are giving you the illusion of feeling the pain and emotion that the character is going. The last game I want to show you is Journey. It is a huge inspiration for a lot of these kind of games. What I love about Journey is two key incidences. There was a piece in this game where all I had to do was just glide through some sand dunes and nothing else. There were no challenges to solve. There were no puzzles. At that brief moment, I was one with the game. And what I would like to call the flow of nothingness. All I felt was, this is my time. I don't have to bother with anything and just, just entered this beautiful flow state and just enjoying the world and how, how well it was created. Very meditative it was for me. And then the other element, which was a brilliant thing done by this company on a social aspect. As I was playing the game at some point, I saw a character that looks just like me. And I, I thought it must be like a non-player character, like a bot from the game. But at that moment, I felt not alone. In this vast desert of no one around, I found a companion. It was much later when I went online and checked that it was actually real players. But you don't know who they are. They come for a brief while. You can play the game together just for that period. And you will really never talk to each other. But you've shared a bond, a moment in time that lasts forever. I deal with that, whoever that person is, neither of us know each other. What a brilliant way to communicate without ever telling who you are and yet a significant bond was formed and you shared a moment of happiness. So games have this ability to do so much more. 
And what I would like to say is that game is beyond mechanics, rules, gameplay. It is personal journey. It varies from person to person, even if you're playing the same game. I would like to call it as living dreams because it's interactive, it's imaginative, and it's gorgeous. And you can still control how you want to take it. Yeah. And this is such a powerful medium that it has only just got started. There are going to be more and more new frontiers to come. With that, thank you so much.